damn it. That's the last thing I want to happen right now, right? So it was the first spin a chrome horn of the season, right? And I'm the first yeah. one to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And, uh, you know, a lot's changed since we last spoke a year ago. Most notably, like, how much weight did you lose? Well, I, a lot has changed. I, you know, I've been racing more often now. Uh, I got my eyes. I had surgery on my eyes. I can see now. I you know, Last time, I think the last time I was doing this podcast with you, I had to wear glasses just to see you, right? So, um I decided to start working out again. I woke up on New Year's and I was like, got on a scale and I was like, God damn, I got to lose some weight. And uh, just, you know, stopped, you know, drinking wine during the week and stopped eating snacks and eating as much sugar. Tried to cut out a lot of sugar out of my diet. And and then as the weight started to come off, I, I started riding my bike again and, and just fell fell in love with my bicycle again. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, we were talking before this this recording. I, I love your your posts. Like, man, Paul's up at 3 a.m. in his garage getting his bicycle out. It's like he's like Jocko or, or David Goggins out here. He's getting her done. Well, that's what time I, that's what time I wake up at. So um, my last go to the bathroom, uh, my bladder problem, when, you know, as you get older, you'll find out when you get older that you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night when, once you get old. And, uh, uh, that last time is usually around three thirty, four 4 o'clock. And then I'm, then I'm up after that. So I, I go out in the garage, get my bike ready, you know, have a little bit, little bite to eat. And then, and then I'm out, out the door as soon as the sun cracks, uh, the sunrise cracks open. So I, I like to get all my workout and everything done, you know, by nine o'clock in the morning. And then I've got the whole day to just do whatever. No, that's great. What was the what was the hardest part for you? Was it, you know, cutting out, you know, because everyone struggles with different stuff depending on their lifestyle, whether it's bread or pasta or, you know, legitimate dessert or the wine. What was the hardest for you to cut out? <laughs> all of it. It was all <laughs> of it. I mean, I like I like desserts. I like cookies. I like ice cream. Um, you know, I'm doing I'm doing so much cardio now and, and riding my bike so much that I can pretty much eat whatever I want now because I've dropped, dropped all the weight and, and I'm doing, I'm burning so many calories a day that, you know, I'll have a scoop of ice cream and I'll have a cookie here. And yeah, you know, but one of the biggest things I cut out is soda too. I cut out, you know, I was drinking like 10 diet Cokes a day and, and now I just drink, I drink water all the time, which was, I've always drank Diet Coke for forever since I was a kid. And I just, I've cut, cut that out. Probably helps your sleep too. Like that's a, that's a decent amount of caffeine kind of trickled in throughout the day. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it helps my sleep or not, but I have, I have great, lately I've been having like crazy vivid dreams that just and I, I normally wake up with like after a dream with a song in my head. And that's usually why I sing it as I'm walking out to the garage, because I always wake up with some so random song in my head for some reason. And, uh, you know, it's just, I don't know, just lately I just, I've just been having these like super vivid animated dreams of just, you know, and I don't even remember what they are. I just know that there's this, I don't feel like I'm sleeping all that much because you're kind of in this state of like whatever's happening in the dream but you know i go to bed early so like i go to bed at like eight o'clock and then but up but i'm up at three thirty or 4 so it's six six hours of sleep which right. is normal but you probably you probably go to bed at 10 or 11 and get up at 10 or 11 <laughs> no no i got a i got a uh he's almost one year old now i got a little guy so i'm up with him at at 6 a.m at least yeah yeah. How many times I bet was he up during the night to eat though when he was he, newborn? Oh, I was up all night, you know. He's uh he's better now. He's sleeping through the night. I bet you yeah. uh I bet you that the vivid dreams from my understanding just listening to health guys is uh cutting out the alcohol and you get like cuz it it suppresses dreams and your like REM cycle. So I bet you, you know, 
when you slow down on the, you know, having even a glass of wine every night, uh, I bet you that kind of backlog of dreams starts rushing through. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, I, I take this, I take this stuff at night, which is like, I don't know. It's like one, one of them is a calming cocktail it's called. And the other one is like called blackout. And it's basically <laughs> where it's like magnesium, it's like magnesium or something. And you know, it's just a drink, you, a powder you mix in a bottle of water. And I drink a bottle of that, but it, but it, I mean, it gives me some crazy dreams. That's all I know. Like some of <laughs> them are good. like ax murdering, some of them are like <laughs> ax murdering dreams, but like, you know, it's it's just weird. Huh. So I mean, I wear I wear I wear one of those rings that like tracks tracks your sleep and all that, and uh, it never really says I got a good night's rest. It always says I'm restless, and uh, I didn't sleep all that well. But I'm the main the main thing that I've been watching on that is you know how my heart rate has has come down now that I've dropped a whole bunch of weight. I mean, my heart rate was statically it was pretty high it was in the 80s and 90s and now my resting heart rate is is down in the in the high 50s so you know all of that stuff was bad i mean i went to the i went to the doctor right after the new year and got a physical and the, and the blood work and the guy was like oh you're like borderline diabetic and you got high blood pressure and that's when i decided okay, that's it i gotta start you know training hard for sure. Yeah, I was, I was, I, I, I trained every day. Like I was, I was always training cause it's just part of my routine, but I was just lifting too much weights and eating too much and, you know, just cut, cut out all the weights. I still lift weights. I do like half an hour, 40 minutes of weights every day, but it's light, lighter and it's push ups and sit ups and calisthenic type stuff rather than, you know, bench press and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That stuff doesn't help on the bicycle. Let's no. uh, let's jump into the SRX deal because when we last spoke, you were kind of in the middle of that that series going into the season. Um, from I guess your perspective, what what shook out in the in the last couple races with you there? Well, I mean that's a that's a long story, but you know I came into this season super motivated to do well. Uh, I knew what I needed to do to to have a good season. I knew that I needed to keep the tires under me. I felt like I was in better shape than I've ever been and uh, got to the first race immediately right out of the box. I was quick in practice, got into the first race and uh, right away in the first race, I think five laps into it, I, I got into turn three at Stafford and I braked a little bit too late and I, I axle hopped a little bit and, you know, once you know, you've driven a stock car and I'm sure you've driven one on an oval. Like once it's axle hops, you got to let off the brake to get it to stop. Right. Or you, otherwise you just skid, you skid along and you can't stop. And I was like, it's, it started to axle hop. So I, I got off the brake and then I just got on the brake and, but I was right, right there. And I got into the back of Kenny Schrader as he was turning in and I, it wasn't a hard hit, but sent him into a spin and I was like god damn it <laughs> that's the last thing I want to happen right now right so it was the first spin a uh, chrome horn of the season right and I'm the first yeah. one to do it yeah right so I'm like so I finish well in the heat I come in the pit lane and I get out of the car, and I, here come, Kenny, here comes Kenny. He, he comes up, and he's livid. You, you know, just, you're getting, you're getting wrecked. You're getting wrecked, you know. Next time I see you, you're getting wrecked. And I apologized to him, and I said, okay, I, 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 it was an accident. I didn't mean to do it. It wasn't intentional. You know, I, lo I locked up the rears, and he wasn't, he didn't want to hear it. So I got through that race. Uh, first weekend had a really good second heat, had a good main finish. I think I finished fourth. Uh, it was NASCAR guys, one, two, three, and then I was fourth. Uh, and you had the, you had the, you know, you had current cup drivers out there this year, like Denny Hamlin and, you know, Kyle Busch and Brad Keselowski. These guys are the best of the best out there. So I, I thought fourth was pretty darn good coming out of there so we get 
to the next weekend and we're back at Stafford again because the track in Vermont was flooded because of all the rain they had up there. So I'm having another good night and I finished second to Tony in the heat race, first heat race, uh, which put me to the back of the field because wherever you finish in the first heat race, you invert for the second. So I finished second. So I started 12th and I'm coming through the field and having another good night. And I, I, I get up to like fifth and I, I pass Kenny Schrader uh, around the outside of turn three and four clean, no, no contact, no leaning on each other. And I look in the mirror and I see he's right there. I'm like, oh, here, here we go. And I get into, I get into turn one and he just, he just drills me from behind and just sends me up the track and spin it out. I'm like, okay, well, I guess we're even now. Right. And, uh, you know, they interview me and I'm like, well, he told me he was going to do that. And that's, you know, and then he, he, his interview, he was like, I didn't, he turned himself, you know, he gave me one of those, the old NASCAR. He turned, he turned himself, he spun out on his own routine. So I, I thought the beef was, was over at, at that point. Um, I had another pretty good night that night. I left there after the second round two was second in the points, uh, to Ryan Newman. And, uh, we get to the third race which, uh, which was, I can't remember the name of the track, but it was a pretty high bank, pretty fast, uh, oval. And I had another good, good heat, um, two good heats. And then in the main, we get down to 10 laps to go. It was a pretty long, uh, final. I think it was like 110 laps or something. And the tire wear was super high at this track. So that we were slipping and sliding all over the place. At, at this track and uh it was pretty high banked but i was running about fifth sixth seventh in that race and kyle bush was in it and clint boyer and um brad keselowski tony they were like the first five cars so i was like right there uh with those guys and we get down to about 10 laps to go and there's a ye- a yellow for something and Newgarden, Joseph Newgarden and I on the restart, uh, I'm on his, his inside and, or he's on my inside, I'm on his outside and we go to restart and we just, he starts, we start leaning on each other, just door banging, door banging, door banging through the corners. And he's leaning on me and then the next corner I squeeze him and it just, that, it just started that for about four or five laps. And I finally got to, I got to his inside and uh, then leaned on him really hard uh, going into three and four. And and we went around the corner, just basically hooked together. And I was kind of was trying to push him up the track. But he was still there on my outside. And then we went another lap around side by side. And I decided to, I saw that Clint Boyer was going down and onto the apron because my car was kind of, it was pretty tight at that track. I couldn't get it to, like, cut in the center. Right. And then I, I saw up the track that Clint Boyer was, like, passing guys on the apron. He'd get, he'd get on the apron, get the thing turned, and then come off the corner. So I tried it uh, going around three and four, and I got down on the apron. And then I got, I got about halfway clear halfway alongside of New Garden. And as I was on the apron, the thing, it, you know, you've driven on it. It loosened up big time. It kind of stepped out on me. Yep. And, but I was into the throttle by then. And I just, I just like chased it up the track. I was like, oh, it's like I'm just sliding up the track. And I connected with New Garden. Basically, it, his nose was at my, about my A pillar. Okay as we came off the corner and it just hooked me right. and I basically, it hooked me into the wall and we both crashed yeah. out. Well, it was a big pile up behind us because the track was pretty fast. And it was like one of those tracks that once a pi- once a crash happens, everybody's in it. And, uh, Kenny was, Kenny was involved in it, but he was a couple, couple cars behind us. Uh, so had really nothing to do with him other than he was involved in it. 
And uh, after the race, he went on one of the, you know, did an interview and said, "I'm, I'm done. If Paul Tracy's racing out here, I'm not, I'm not coming back." Hmm. Did and, he have uh, wor- Did he have words with you after that wreck? Yeah, he came. He came over to me. I was still in my car because they were trying to fix it. Uh, and he came over to my car and he was like, Hey, what happened? I said, he goes, who turned you? I said, I think it was new garden. Cause I was racing with him and, and, you know, he's like, okay. And he walked away and then he did a TV interview basically saying if Paul Tracy's still racing in this series, I quit or something, something that to that effect, I'm, I'm not coming back. Hmm. Did, so uh, like, oh, did he, like, do you think he ha- like, is that? Does he have that much pull there, you know, compared to you, I guess? Well, I guess so, because I got kicked out. He was still racing, right? So I guess he does have that kind of pull. But, um, you know, the next day, I didn't hear anything from anybody uh, that night. Uh, in the, about 4 o'clock the next day, I get a call from the guy who runs SRX. It's a guy named Don Hawk. And... Uh, he wanted to hear my version of what happened. And I told him basically exactly what I told you. I said, you know, coming down at the end of the race, and Newgarden and I were, you know, battling for fifth on track with under 10 laps to go. And now, now it's elbows out, right? You're, now you're, you're really going for it. And I said, we were leaning on each other for like four or five laps. And I said, we, I, I started sliding up the track and I, we got connected and we wrecked, you know, just one of those things. And, He's like, well, uh, he got all mad, and he was like, I don't hear any remorse in your voice. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't I, I didn't know what you want me to be remorseful about. I said, I, I, it's not like I wanted it to happen. You know, I understand these cars are expensive to fix. That was, that was another thing, too. It was like uh, before the season even started, like Tony sat us all down in the, in the motorhome, in his motorhome, and he's like, hey, look. You know, we had a lot of crashes the last two years. It costs a lot of money to fix these cars. And you know how it is. Like when you wreck one of those, even if it's a fiberglass body, it still costs fucking a ton of money. Yeah. You know, if, especially if you get frame damage or an A arms and, you know, wheels and, you know, so it's, I get it. It's not, it's not cheap. And plus there's no time either. You're going week to week to week and you're on the road. It's not like you can go back to the shop and fix it. So it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work for these guys. So, you know. Then you go out and guys start wrecking each other. So I, there was kind of this message going down of like, hey, we got to knock this off. This guy's wrecking each other and dumping each other. Because that was, that was happening quite a bit. And So anyway, I get the call. And uh, Don says, well, we got to do something. If this, was a, if this was a real, if this was NASCAR, we'd have to you know, do a penalty and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, tell me what your, what's your penalty. Tell me what you're thinking. He goes, well, we might sit you out for a race or more. We don't know yet. We haven't decided. I said, well, I said, call me when you want, call me when you want to tell me then. <laughs> right. And, yeah. uh, he called me back about an hour later and he's like, ah, you know what? We're going to maybe suspend you for a race and then, uh, we'll reevaluate it after after the next race and i'm like okay it is what it is right Right. so and then uh two or three days about three or i don't know two three or four days later at the next race they basically announced that i was out for the rest of the year so they never told me that they said they'd reevaluate it after one race i was just like okay and then the odd the odd thing is is i then got another call from from him so i was kind of ticked off at that point about how that was, how that was handled, and and then they said, "Well, would, do you want to come and do the TV uh, for the last two races and be the TV commentator?" And I'm like, in my mind, I was like, "No, I don't really want to do that." And he's like, "I talked to Lisa about it, and she was like, just go do it. You know, you got nothing, you got nothing else to do. Just, you know, even if it." You don't ever drive with them again. Just end things the right way and just go do it. So right. I agreed agreed to go do it, and then uh, then that deal was pulled off the table too. So that's that's kind of where it where it ended up, you know. And then then I got the call to to go racing uh, this race in Brazil, 
uh, right after SRX was over and, you know, on a better note, went down there and kicked ass and, you know, had fastest lap of the weekend and had a, had a great weekend. So it kind of ended my summer in, on, a, on a good note. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how did, even, even if it, you know, however you feel about the competitiveness of the Brazil series, a win is a win. Like that's got to, that's got to feel really good getting a win. Well, the the one main guy that was there that is it was the hot shot is a guy named uh, Gabriel Casagrande, and he's the 2021 Stock Car Series champion. He's the Porsche Cup champion in, in Brazil, and he's leading the championship this year in uh, in in Stock Car Series in Brazil. So he was there at that race, and you know how it is. Anywhere you go, it doesn't matter where you go, whether it's in a go kart. Or it's a big race. When you go to a local track and you go to somebody's local track, there's always fast guys there that you don't know about, right? There's there could be big name drivers, but there's always a local and local guys that know the track really well and they're they're quick. So there was you know there was some some legit quick guys there. And this guy, uh, Casagrande, he's he actually just did a did a simulator test uh, last week for Jimmy Vassar for KV race or not KV for, for uh, the Lexus team. Yeah. yeah so they, uh, they, they Sullivan. I, I, you know, yeah, Vassar, I texted Jimmy text, called me after I got back from Brazil. He's like, Hey, tell me about that guy. Casa Grande. He goes, big house. Tell me about this guy. Big house. I'm like, <laughs> right. Cause Casa Grande is big house. Yeah. Yeah. Spanish. yeah. She's like, yeah. tell me about this guy. Casa Grande, big house. I'm like, ah, I guess he's the guy down there in Brazil. He's like the the hot hot shot. He's young. He's like super fit. He's and he goes, well, you were quicker than him, right? I'm like, yeah, I, I was quick. I had a quicker lap time than him, and in in qualifying, I beat him in the first race, but I had a shitty second race. But uh, he's apparently the guy down there. He goes, yeah, we're gonna test him on the simulator. Uh, he's flying to Charlotte. I guess he did the, he did the test this last Monday. Uh, hmm. a simulator test at the Lexus simulator, the Toyota simulator for NASCAR. So, and I said to Jimmy, I said, how do you, how do you evaluate a guy for a race seat based off of a simulator? Because everybody that I've talked to, in, like I, I had a long conversation with, uh, as we we're sitting around and I don't know how many Sims you've driven or how, if you've driven any high dollar, I, I drove uh i've got a decent one but i did a i did a kbm race at most port so i drove that simulator that toyota simulator in charlotte okay so you've actually been in the toyota simulator so uh, you know i know like i have a simulator it's sitting right right behind me right here and it's a sixty thousand dollar simulator and it doesn't feel anything like the real thing you know yeah. and uh, yeah it moves around but there's no g-forces there's no heat and i can't i can't you can't feel the tire on the road you know, there's vibration and there's like noise, like you can hear tire noise and rocks and pebbles and, but you actually don't, there, there's no feel of the tire connected to, to the road. So when the car goes into a slide, it's all based off of visual of yeah. how you react to it. So it's completely different than driving a real race car. And everybody that I've talked to that's driven you know, I, this is a, this, this is a home sim, and it's a really nice home sim. Super expensive, and you know, you know, four axis motion, and um, really nice piece. But you know, everybody that I've talked to, like I sat, I was sitting in the motorhome at one of the SRX SRX races with New Garden and uh, Brad Keselowski, and we were talking about sim stuff, and they were like, oh, "It's fucking useless," you know, like. You know, New Garden was like, yeah, like the last two years at Indy, we, he goes, we based all of our setup work at Penske off of the Chevy simulator. And he goes, we sucked for two years. Like the tire model was wrong and it, they were do, they were sold on this. You got to have the car, you got to set the car up on the simulator. And, you know, and I haven't driven a, the Chevy simulator and I haven't driven the Dallara simulator and I haven't driven the Toyota simulator and I haven't driven the Honda simulator. So I don't, I've never been in a, a high dollar simulator. Uh, but the guys that I know that have driven them have said, it's not the same. It's still not the same. It's not, it's not a hundred percent. So how you, 
how you base evaluating a driver for his race ability in real life on something that's not completely 100%, I don't know how you come to a conclusion on that. Because basically you have to be like a gamer, you know, because it's like, and, and I don't know. You you've driven the the Toyota Simulator. What is it? What is it like? Is... Oh, it, it's it, again. It's definitely not the same. I mean, you yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I think you are evaluating his his simulator ability. You're not. You know, there's a bunch of. If that's the case, why not just hire the guy who won you know the latest esports championship or the latest i racing championship for your ride, right? Yeah. Was, well, that's what I said to Jimmy. I said I said. You know, like how, like I said, what are you evaluating? He goes, well, you know, we want to know what his feedback is. Uh, when we make changes on the simulator, we want to know if he can feel the changes. Uh, we, I said, well, wh- what do the changes do? If it's not accurate, what are you, ev- how are you evaluating what he can feel? But so I guess they look, you know, he said, he, you know, look for if his times were erratic and up and down and things like that. But I mean, I've spent quite a bit of time in a simulator and I'm all over the goddamn place, you know, <laughs> on it, you know, I'm spinning out and crashing and, you know, I can do a pretty quick time, but it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, hmm. it's just, uh, it's an odd dynamic, but you know, Jimmy was like, Hey, it's working for us. We're doing pretty well on track. We go to most of the racetracks and our setups are pretty good. We're competitive out of the box. So this is the way we do it. So, you know, which is surprising to me because Jimmy is super old school. He's, I don't think he's ever even driven a simulator himself. And he's, he's kind of a throwback old school guy, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you've got, you know, even if it's not there yet, I think regardless the way technology advances, you know, whatever how much better it gets every year eventually you got to be there so you may as well start now because as soon as you know ai is legitimate ai you're gonna get the right <laughs> setup off the freaking simulator that's for sure well there's one i'm not going to name names of team of teams but there's a there's a team here that's won an imsa championship that has shops here in town and uh they i actually went by there the other went by there the other day because i'm buddies with the guy that runs t- that owns a team and uh, I hadn't been there since early in the spring. And I walked in their, their one smaller shop, and I was like, holy shit, they got this sim going in there. And it's like a $2 million sim that, like, it's completely closed in. They've closed in the shop, inside the shop, with a, with a box. And this, this one's like, slides across the floor, back and forth. You know, it's the wow. same sim that Ferrari has. Uh, it's got a... Th- 290 degree screen that's like it's got to be 15 feet tall and you know the 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 the, the circumference of the screen is probably 30 feet in diameter or more so i mean this and this this thing is it's on like sliders and the whole the whole rig like slides back and forth you know (laughs) so i'm they have to do like 40 40 or 50 hours of setup work on it once they get the installation done. And I said, well, I'll come down and drive it. They were going to fly somebody in to drive it. I said, I'll come down and drive it for four or five hours a day just to see, you know, help you out, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, jumping back to the SRX deal, I'm curious. I don't know if you can answer the question or not. You had uh, that wine sponsor on the car. How does that deal work? Did you, did you guys get a, a paycheck? Were you able to bring your own sponsor and try and no, put some money in I, your jeans that way? I have uh, I have a guy that I, I've known a long time uh, that used to be an agent and sponsor finder of mine, and uh, he his name is Doug Barnett. He's a good friend of mine, and he he uh, he has a bunch of sponsors in his in his portfolio that he that he places the sponsorships with. So he had he has Geico, uh, he has Camus, he has Sport Clips, um, and a, and a few others. So if you look throughout the years of, of going back, you'll see that at one time I drove a stock car that had Sport Clips on it, and I drove the Indy car that had Geico on it at the Indy 500 a couple times. And and this he's got Camus as one of his one of his 
deals in, in his quiver, I guess, and uh, he, he placed the money uh, with with uh, with SRX. But money in my pocket, no, I didn't I didn't get anything I didn't get anything out of it. But I, I uh, got a pretty cool sponsor, and they they send me they send me wine that I'm not I'm, I only drink on Saturday night now, so I'm not I'm not drinking it every single night of the week. <laughs> Which is probably a good good idea, anyway. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. I had a, I had a beer sponsor for a while, and they were just giving us beer, and I decided Sending it probably wasn't pallet, even worth it. Yeah, pallets of, pallets of beer. I had a beer sponsor too, and like um, when I drove for Budweiser back in '95, and like literally, they're like, "Hey, what do you do? You need drinks?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, whatever. Just send over whatever." And a truck came over with like you know five pallets of Budweiser. I'm like, "What am I gonna do with all this all this Budweiser?" You know. Yeah. You just end up giving it away to people. <laughs> no, exactly. It's you know you got to have it around so you're not drinking something else when the time comes. But the problem is you, you can't you can't you can't even you can't give away Bud Light right now. Nobody nobody wants it. <laughs> no, no, not even for free. No, I know. <laughs> That's true. So, uh, do you think like I, and maybe it sounds like you don't know, but do you think you'll get the invite back to SRX? I mean, I I I think you were such a draw there that you know they need someone like you and i don't think they have anyone else that that kind of fits the fits the bill i don't know i don't i don't have my i don't have my hopes up and i'm not going to hold my breath right now but you know the series the series now is kind of it's kind of gotten away from what what it, it was originally designed to be you know like in the beginning it was it was a tv show a racing TV show and it was, they wanted contact and they wanted bumping and grinding and they wanted drama and they wanted guys to play it up. And, and, and that's what I, I did. Uh, and it's kind of, it's kind of turned into like this. It's now it's like a professional racing series. Now it's kind of not really a TV show anymore. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's as serious as a heart attack now with, you know, when you got, got current level cup guys they're not coming there to goof around and like i mean not that there's goofing around but you know like those guys they want to win and like i want to win too but um and, and everybody does when when the green flag drops everybody's in the same mindset of, that they want to win but it's uh it's just kind of gotten away from what the original concept of what ray everingham uh, his his uh, original vision of what it was going to be it's it's kind of turned into something else and now it's uh you know there's really which is sad there's really not many open wheel guys left left in it like there's was, there was me and Kanan only does a couple now they only had him do two last year new garden did one race elio did uh two or three marco is 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 there so there was really only Marco and I that were full time, and then the rest was all like, you know, cup guys. So you know, and then you had like, you know, current cup guys. Like I've I've been retired nearly fifteen years, you know. And I you know I said I said to uh, to Don Hawk. I mean, earlier in the year, way back in the spring before uh, SRX started, they had a test day. At, I think it was Caraway. And they had Kyle Busch and Keslowski and all these uh, – Logano drove the car. And they had all these guys come out and drive the car. They had got, got a day in the car. I'm like, I never got a day in the car. I show up and I get five laps and we go racing. I said, these guys – I said, I said these guys are racing like 500 to 800 miles every single weekend. Like if Kyle Busch goes and does trucks, Xfinity, and Cup all in the same weekend – He's doing close to a thousand miles of, of racing in a stock car every single weekend, and you give him a test day yeah. before he gets to come run the SRX car. I said that guy doesn't need a test day. I said <laughs> he's like racing every single week all year round. I said I haven't driven the car in 11, 11 months. It's the last time I was in the car, you know. And he's like, so it's it's just uh, it's kind of it's kind of gotten, which is a shame. It's kind of gotten geared towards you know and i get it i mean people want to see the top cup cup guys but you know in the beginning when when ray started it you know he kind of envisioned getting getting some champions from everything sports cars and and uh motorcycles or just give give 
different guys a shot at it, and it's it's kind of just turned into a into another into another version of stock car racing. Right, right. So you're uh, you know now you're you're fit. You've done that 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 uh, the race in Brazil. You got a win under your belt. What uh, what do you have your sights set on next? Uh, as far as, you know, and do you have desires to run a whole season somewhere? I don't really have desires to run a whole season. I would like to do, do some this and that. I'd like to, I'd like to take your dad's car out next, <laughs> see, see what he says about it. But I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any, uh, you know, game plan set out. And, you know, like if something comes along, you know, I'd, I'd like to run, I, I would like to run some endurance races. Um, I have a buddy that, uh, and I don't know if you've heard of this, but there's, there's a 24 hour race at spa and they're like these little, little small, they're almost like legends cars. They look like they're little small cars in, in Europe and they have like a, a, a four cylinder motor in it. So a buddy of mine here in town that actually, actually owns the bike shop. Uh, he's, going to rent a couple cars and him and there's some rich guys here in town that also go to our track here in town they're going to go do the 20 this 24 hours of spa race in these cars and they asked me if i wanted to come do it so i want to do i want to do that kind of stuff where it's not like i still want to drive you know i'd like to drive some lmp3 stuff i have the license now to do that because I, I, I got downgraded to an amateur license i'm a silver now Perfect. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to go for a bronze because I turned 55 in December. So you're supposed to get downgraded to bronze when you're 55, but I, I doubt they'll. I doubt they'll go for that. But uh, I just would like to do a little bit of this and that, you know. Yeah. You. You. Uh, is it your LMP3 car? I always see you testing. Yeah. Yeah. I have my own. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a. I. I had a Decoin car before and i sold it because it, it was super it was a little bit high maintenance the, the uh cvs and cv bearings had were super high maintenance on it to take to look after them and i ran that car i had that car for a couple of years and then i sold it and i bought a ligier i actually bought it from george kurtz who, who runs crowdstrike racing he has he has like three cars i think he's got five lmp3 cars and he had he had you know, one of them he wanted. I asked him if he wanted to sell it, and he sold it to me at a pretty good deal. So that's the car I'm running, running right now, and I'm going to go out to the track probably tomorrow. I'm going to look at the weather. It's still pretty hot here, so I'm, I want to wait for it to cool down a little bit more, and uh, so it doesn't motor. It gets the, you have to go super early in the morning, of course. The, it'll run on the hot side, you know, temperature wise. Right. Right. Yeah, that those, those cars are awesome. I got the opportunity a uh, guy was testing out at Mosport to jump in one and it was like oh, yeah. holy cow, this is a serious race car, you know, and Super I think a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, they have a lot of, quite a bit of downforce. They handle really well. They stop well, just not tons of power. It's just got enough power to work, that you could get in trouble, but it's it you know, could it could probably use 100 more horsepower, but at 450 it's a pretty fun car to drive, you know. Yeah. I don't know what you what you thought of it. What kind of lap time does it do around most sport? I mean, I, I he's like, all right, five laps, five laps, no more, and I'm like, okay, I got got to get her done. Was My it? Fir- uh, it was um, I forget the team now. Uh, Mantella's Cana- car, yeah, Mantella. Was it that, Can- that Canadian team up there, AWA? Yep, yep, that car. Yeah, so um, that's the same. That's the same car that I used to have. They run. They run a Ducoin. So they, uh, the cars, they handle really well, uh, but they're, they're a little bit tougher to maintain than the Ligier. Right. Yeah. So hard, I got- to get, hard to get parts for, hard to get pieces for, like I had a CV joint go out in, it blew up a CV and it was like, literally took me like two months to get it. And it was $12,000 for CV, you know, yes. the whole, cause they don't sell just, you know, you got to buy the whole complete cv inner and outer they don't just sell it like rebuilt like it, it basically when the cv blew up it took the axle out with it so then you got to replace the whole damn thing and i think it was it was like eleven thousand bucks and then plus shipping and 
plus Jeez. labor with some guy to do change it for me. So it ended up it ended up being like a fifteen thousand dollar deal for to change one CV. You know, yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I think I did a one seventeen, but I bet you could probably do a one fourteen there. Yeah, That'd I don't know 15. what they run when they when they run up there. Yeah. Lap time was. So would you? Uh, you're you're. You have some desires, at least. What, to is, do the, what is a stock? What is a stock car run around there? Uh, I, I've still got the lap record there at a one twenty one nine. That's pretty quick. Yeah, it's pretty I, mean, I would have thought that the LMP three car would go quite a bit quicker than that than a stock car. Yeah, I mean we're you know I we're probably at the wheels maybe seventy eighty more horsepower. I, I, they've got them working pretty good now. The the stock car is freaking. They should. They have no business going around Mosport that fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have desires. I, I can't. I can't. I can't wait to find out in your dad's car. Right. 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 <laughs> I'll have to show him this recording here. This is Paul's case. Make your case. Um, so you clearly have desires to run or, the. Or or at least at least do some vintage racing with him. I'd like to drive some vintage cars too. I mean, yeah. Only. The, the only time, the only time that I drove a vintage car, well, I've dri- driven it twice. I, I ran, I ran with your dad at, at the, uh, they had that pro am race, at, uh, at Indy, and I ran with a guy, a Canadian guy, Gar- uh, Gary, Gary, Gary Moore, Gary, Gary Moore. I ran with him, and we, and we won, won the race. My first, first time in the thing. He was a super, super nice guy. Yeah, yeah, great guy. That I did that race maybe the year after. Or so me and. Uh... Me and uh, well, I did it with Jimmy Kite and then Bobby Labonte, and we we won yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, Bobby's yeah. a super nice guy. Absolutely, it was a. Uh, those cars are so much fun, and the best place to do it is I don't know if the, what they call it. I think it's like the U.S. Nationals or something at Coda, and to get to drive those, yeah. you know, seven hundred horsepower Corvette at Coda is badass. Yeah, the second time I did it with Gary, we we went to the same track, and and uh, I'm out practicing in the car and the throttle hung wide open on the car i was like coming into down the back straightaway and you take that left hander and then you go into that kind of kind of quick flat chicane where you take all the curbs at indy yeah yeah. so i i I, uh i i i go to turn in there and i get off the gas and it throttle sticks wide open i was like shit and i you know instantly i'm in the grass and i'm locked up in the grass and and I, i clutched it and you know the motor, but I'm I'm in the grass now, and it was first thing in the morning, and I just I can't stop. I I went I ended up in the tire barrier, and I I crunched the uh, the front fender, and a little bit of the hood, on it, and I I come back, and I'm like what? They're like what happened? I said the throttle stuck wide open. They're like, yeah right, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. So I, they they bring the car back uh, on the flatbed, and the throttle stuck wide open, right on the. Uh, it's still wide open in the car. They're like, "Oh shit, yeah, it is wide open." So they uh, they monkeyed around with the throttle and thought it was something or other, and and uh, fixed it. And then went out. You know, the, the next practice, they went out and uh, poor Gary. He went out and same thing happened to him. And he was this time. He got through that chicane, took that right hander. And then he was coming out uh, in that long right hander that goes on to the banking between one and two, and the throttle stuck on him there. And so that's a corner where I could almost take it flat, but he he couldn't take it flat, and he he got out of the throttle, and the throttle stuck, and he basically drove it right into the wall, uh, in between turn one and two at Indy, as you oh. come out onto the onto the banking out there, which is pretty tricky, anyway, and. It, the same thing. The throttle hung wide open on him. The car. And this time, the car was it was demolished pretty good. So he didn't get to he didn't get to race that weekend. And they actually put me in another guy's car, which was I didn't think it was it would handle that well. But it was it was the car like your dad had. It was like a '69 or '68 Corvette. Uh, and it was it was actually pretty fun to drive. It didn't have a. I think your dad's car has a big block in it, doesn't it? Yeah, he's got a big block. Yeah, this one had a small block in it, and I was I was running like second in the race, and then uh, uh, the guy had handed off the car to me, and we had a good pit stop, and I was running like second or third in the race. I was ahead of Matt 
Matty Brabham, who was in like some 63 yeah. Corvette. That thing was, was super trick. I was ahead of him. And then the gearbox started like I, it wouldn't, it started to not take downshifts and pop out of gear. It had a synchro mesh gearbox in it and not like a crash box. So yeah. like the gearbox, the gearbox crapped out on it, but it was, it was fun to drive. I didn't think, I didn't think those cars handled that well. No, they've got them working pretty good. You should uh, you should look at and I don't know how, you know I think a couple guys hire drivers. We did this year. We did the uh, the, the Le Mans Classic race in a GT40, and oh, uh, Daytona. No, 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 at Le Mans. Oh wow! Yeah, it was it was really cool, and uh, you know I guess going back to the simulator stuff, that is a huge benefit. Well, see, learning that's, that that's track. The kind of, that's the that's the kind of things I'd like to do, stuff like that. So tell your dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too bad. You can be my, you can be my agent on this deal. <laughs> right, right. How about he's, that? He's if got he's two. Going back to, if he's going back to Le Mans with a vintage car, tell him I'd like to go with him and run. Right. Yeah, the problem is he's, he's I, got, I, he's got two see, eager sons. <laughs> when, I see, when I see him at Barrett Jackson this this year, I'm going to get him wasted and then hit him up. <laughs> that would, I'm going to start, start giving him drinks. <laughs> getting him wasted would be trickier than getting him to give you a ride, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you need, more, you need more than three drivers to go to Le Mans, don't you? It's actually, it was a neat, uh, neat format. No, we had, we had three guys, like my brother, my dad, and myself, and it's three one-hour races within the 24 hours. So each class does their oh, one-hour okay. race. So it's not a 24-hour race then. No, yeah, no, but I, those old cars, I think that'd be have a hard time getting those things to run for 24 hours, but I know they do like a vintage 24 hour at Daytona. Yep. Yep. They is do that, that. Is that a real, a real 24 hour race? <sighs> That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah. I, everyone tells us that, you know, the best one to do is the six hours of spa and the vintage yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got you've got desires to do clearly to race the Pinty series and you want to go to you want to go to Mosport as opposed to the as opposed to the Toronto Indy, you think? I do the Toronto Indy. I I find I find it kind of amazing that the Pinty's guys wouldn't be like, "Hey, we should have Paul come and do a race when Brazil is calling for me to go go down there." Yeah. You know? Yeah, probably a little bit different deal just with those guys owning all the cars. Yeah. Whereas as yeah. everyone here kind of has their own their own stuff. Um, what you should try and work on, and I it probably hasn't, it, it certainly hasn't been announced yet. It's just rumors. You've probably heard them too, of the Cup Series going back to Montreal along with the Pinty Series. Yeah, that would be. Uh, I don't think they ever ran Cup. Did they ever run Cup there? I know nope. they ran Xfinity no. there. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the last time they – I don't know if it was the last time they ran there, but I remember Robbie Gordon and somebody had a big <laughs> blow up there. And he, he just – Robbie decided that he was the winner and somebody got spun out. And it was like a huge, like, melee after the race and a fight and huge, uh, fine, for <laughs> Rob, huge fine for Robbie. But Yeah, I remember that yeah. race well. I was, I was like a little kid sitting in the stands in the hairpin when I was like, oh, there's Robbie. He's not even going to hit the brakes here. <laughs> Yeah, I think somebody, I don't know, I can't remember what happened. I think somebody hit him and moved him out of the way, and then he got back and just, like, took the guy out or something. I don't I don't even know who it was, but it was some. Yeah, I don't, I I don't know. I can't remember. But that's, I don't, that's know a, was, I don't know if it was Boris or, it could have been Boris said, wasn't it? Yeah, it could have been. Could have very well been. But, yeah, I, rem- I think Robbie Gordon was a little bit of the villain in that one. I think I think he used the, the chrome horn. I know, they ga- I know they gave him the black flag, and he didn't come in for it, and he kept going around, and he, and he, he finished first, like, but he, they stopped scoring him. Yep. And then yep. he, like, did – I think he did donuts and everything after the <laughs> race was over or something, which is, like, typical, typical Robbie. Yeah. No, that was great. That was great. Yeah, it, it 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 they should have a NASCAR race there because it it will be the number one attendance for any freaking NASCAR race period. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So what uh, what does the winter look like for you? You know, are you do you spend some time, um, you know, kind of hitting guys up for rides, kind of seeing what's around, not really, training? Not really. No, I'm, I'm going to. Uh, what do I got going on? We got. Uh, I'm. You know, we're coming into our good season of weather now, so I want to train train hard through the winter. That's obviously, you know, going to be big for me. Um, we're going to Florida to go on a boat boat run from Miami to Key West with some friends in November. 
Uh, the only the only thing I have going on right now, racing wise, is I might be going back down to Brazil in December. Their last race is at uh, Interlagos, which is a pretty cool track, uh, and they have uh, their their NASCAR series, and they run these. Uh, it's called Copa Truck down there, which is oh, like yeah. semi trucks. So the guy who is the partner now in the NASCAR series also in Brazil, he also owns the Copa Truck Series. So they are uh, trying to put together a deal for me uh, the, to, to come and run in that. So they got, they got to find a, find a little bit of money to pay pay me and, and uh, pay my expenses travel down there, which is what they did for this, this NASCAR race. So. Um, I'm waiting, waiting to hear on that. So I've been, I've actually been on my sim prepping for, for Interlagos, which is a pretty, pretty fun track. Yeah, that's, that would be cool. Those, and those trucks, like I'm, you know, I can't wait to see the footage of you in those trucks. That'll be awesome. They're fast, I guess. I guess they'll go like 150 miles an hour. And yeah. like, I've seen some of the crashes they have, like when they crash, it's like the thing gets like destroyed. Yeah. So it's like, uh, I guess you know they're they're proper. I guess they're a thousand horsepower. These uh, these trucks that they run down there, and they're super super high tech for what they are. And there's there's Mercedes, and there's like there's four or five different manufacturers in in, in the thing. So, I mean, I'll try anything. You know, if if somebody asks me to do it, I'll do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, that's uh, that's definitely the mark of a real racer for sure. Do you? Yeah. Uh, you uh it's funny i was your buddy tagliani there him and i were talking at at the last race do you do the cold tub stuff yeah i do yeah okay. i started doing that as well it's good i, mean, I, I, I can't li- go ahead i like it i think you know i think it helps it helps me re- uh, recover uh from from workout I, I go in it for five minutes and i i built my own because you know, i I wanted to get one, but I started looking at them all on Instagram. You see these ads, and they're like four thousand dollars for this. And, you know, they're kind of expensive for what they are. And then, then I saw this Facebook group, like "Do It Yourself Cold Plunge," and so basically, guys are buying. You buy a freezer at uh, Home Depot or wherever. Like for you guys, I bought a freezer for like five hundred bucks, and uh, I bought a thermostat which plugs into the wall, then you plug the freezer into the thermostat and you can set the temperature on the thermostat to whatever temperature you want the water to be. Because if you if you filled up a freezer full of water and you just put it on freeze, it would eventually it would freeze it into a block of ice. Right. And you couldn't get in it, right? So I have a thermostat that the f- freezer plugs into and that thermostat turns on and off and I've got it set at f- 45 degrees. And then... Uh, I mean, it's pretty simple. I have like a, then I have a, like a fish aquarium uh, filter for it. Like it's like a circulating filter and uh, that's it. I fill, fill the thing up with ice and water and it, it's, I get in it after I, after I'm done my workout in the morning, I get in it for like five minutes every day. Um, I think for sure it helps. Uh, it's a bit of a mindset too, because doing it like just the initial getting in it like you dread every time you got to get in you're like oh my god i gotta get get." it's like the first minute is the hardest the hardest and then once you're once you're in it once you get past the one minute mark it's your body kind of like goes into this it's it's a weird feeling like your body goes into you can feel you can feel the heat coming off of your body like there's a barrier of warmth that comes off of your body It's, it's a weird sensation once you're in that cold water and then uh you know, but the biggest the biggest thing I hear about it is is that if you if you stay in a cold plunge for five minutes a day, your body goes into uh, hyper calorie burn after you do that, and your body wants to warm itself back, so it's burning burning calories like crazy. So, like I've just I've been trying to you know lose lose this weight and lose. You know, it, so burning calories and burning fat, they say that the cold punch, it really promotes that quickly, even, even more so than, than working out. Like that's for, for whatever reason, your body trying to warm itself up, it just burns calories like crazy. 
Yeah, absolutely. So the Tagli any story is I've I've got the same thing at my house. I've got the I've got the deep freeze and that's what I use, right? And I just yeah, run yeah. it on a uh, on a Christmas tree timer. So I don't have the thermostat, yeah, yeah. but I just whatever, run it for 4 hours. But I've got this little portable one that I brought to I'll three send, I'll yeah. send you the the thermostat that I have cuz I got it off Amazon and it was it was like 30 bucks. Perfect. Yeah, yeah I need just, I need to do can, that. You can set the temperature I mean, I can set it to wherever I want. I can set it. I can set it down to like 35 degrees if I want. But I don't. I don't have it that cold. But you can kind of, if you want to start getting it colder and colder, you know. I don't know what temperature you have 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 yours at, but they say like, I have mine set at like 45 degrees, and when I get in it, it's like 46 degrees. It's, but they say like 40 is like optimal. Yeah. Yeah. I keep it, I keep it at 40. Um, and my brother keeps it even colder. So you got to smash the ice sometimes to get in and there's like really? a little, little ring of ice. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I've, I've gotten in, I've gotten in mine after I've kind of re- refilled it up with some, some ice. Cause when I get in and out of it, I spill some water out of it. So I've got to occasionally top it back up. So I'll buy a couple 20 pound bags of ice and I've gotten in it back in it when it's like, after I've put in like 40 pounds of ice back in it and it's like when it's high 30s 38 39 it's a big difference between that and 45 it's like holy shit balls it's cold yeah you know? <laughs> yeah absolutely so i got well, i got those instagram ads for those little uh those little like portable ones so i'm like okay i'm gonna bring this to three rivers to track. It, it's gonna be hot as yeah. shit there so yeah, yeah. So Tag sees it there, and he gets the same one, but for his house. So he's got it yeah. like in his shower, and he's like, "What do you do, man? What do you do?" Because I go to the convenience store every day, and they're looking at me weird. I'm a slave to the ice. I bring the ice every day to my <laughs> yeah. house. I refill brother, it. Brother, <laughs> yeah. brother, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> exactly that. So I set him up with the. I'm like, dude, you need a freezer. You can't. You can't be spending yeah. two hours a day f- making no. ice. <laughs> yeah. no it's i didn't want to deal with that either yeah so no, that's good well um man really appreciate you coming on um hope to see you back in uh in some stuff you know i love that you're you're running the whole season i think that's that's cool i'm a big fan of short seasons like you know that srx yeah. deal was cool so uh would love to see you in some vintage stuff and and you know, ideally in the Pinty series. All right, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make you my agent now. You're gonna have to work on your dad. <laughs> make it all right. happen. All right. If if not, I'll make some calls. I'll make some calls. <laughs> see who else. See who else. Uh, if the old man's too stubborn. All right. All right. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, man. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. See you guys next week. <laughs>